Okay, we'll just do the November 2021 T23. Okay, so this one will start from the beginning. Right, so this one, I think for the earlier parts of the question, we can actually breeze quite quickly through. Okay, right, so let's go with uh, P23, question one, one word, P23, November 21. Okay, right, now we have a solid cylinder of weight 24 newton that is made of material of density 850 kg per meter cube. The cylinder has a length of 0 0.18 meter as shown in figure 1.1. Show that the cross sectional area A of the cylinder is 0 0.016 meter square. So, given the information that you have here, you have to make use of the weight. Weight I know is mg. Okay. But then at the same time, I know that density is m over v such that m is rho v. So this equation thus becomes rho v g. And then at the same time, I also know that I'm given the length as well as the cross-sectional area A. So these two, the area and the length, will give me volume. So in my case, Volume is area times length. I want to sum out the volume. I will get uh, AH. Oh, sorry, this one, I write it as L, right? This one should be H. Okay, so you're going to get that answer equals to AH. So you have all these values already, the weight, the density, the length, as well as the gravitational acceleration. Then from here, you can easily just find out what is your area. So this one is pretty straightforward, okay? Now part B is the one that the deal, that would start to deal with the forces specifically on equilibrium, up thrust, and spring force. So this one is a bit more challenging. Okay, so if we look at part B, they tell you right now that cylinder that you have in A is attached by a spring to the bottom of a rigid container of liquid as shown in figure 1.2. The cylinder is in equilibrium with the bottom face at a depth of 0 0.1 meter below the surface of the liquid. The tension of the spring is 8 newtons. Okay. Now show that the up thrust acting on the cylinder due to the liquid is 32 newton. So if you consider the cylinder right now, they're asking you to find the force on the cylinder, the up thrust on the cylinder. I know that the up thrust on the cylinder is always going to be acting upwards. Now, for the cylinder itself, you have weight as well as the spring force acting on it. Now, this system here that you see, you can think of it as having two different individual objects. The first one is the cylinder. The second one is the spring itself. Okay, the second one is the spring itself. So when they put the cylinder in, the cylinder has a tendency to float outwards. But then at the same time, it is attached to your spring. So as the cylinder tries to float outwards, is actually being pulled. The spring is actually being pulled as the cylinder tries to float outwards. So in my case, I know that this spring, the spring force is going like this. So this is like the direction of the spring force F here. So this one I can say that the spring is being pulled apart. It's being pulled apart a cylinder tries to float upwards. So I know that my, therefore my force is going to be like this, no? the, the directions that you see here, no? it's being pulled apart. So I know the forces acting on the spring is going like this, all right? So from here, I also know that 
the cylinder is attached to your spring. So from Newton's third law, I know that if the spring force on the spring is acting upwards like this, the spring force on the cylinder must therefore be acting downwards. Okay, that's why I can say that the spring force is acting downwards here right now. It is the force exerted by the spring on the cylinder. Okay, so I have spring force downward, I also have weight downwards, and then I also have up thrust acting up, uh, acting upwards now. And because I know that this thing is in equilibrium, I know that whatever sum of outward force is going to be the same as the sum of downward force. So I'm going to get U is equal to W plus F. W is 24, spring force is 8, therefore it's 32 Newton. Okay, so this is how you recognize the forces. And then after that, we go on to the second part where they ask you to calculate the density of the liquid. Now, there's still the liquid. This one, after having uh, found the up thrust, you can actually find the density of the liquid because one of the main things that you would have learned in your syllabus thus far is that up thrust is the weight of displaced liquid. Okay, the weight of the displaced liquid. So, in my case, weight of displaced liquid could be mg. And then this one, I can rearrange it to rho Vg. And then after that, the V can be expressed as rho Ahg. Same like the workings that I mentioned to you just now. Okay. So from here, you already know the values. Up thrust is 32. The area is 0 0.16. The height is 0 0.17, the gravitational acceleration is 9.1 at 9.81. So eventually you're going to get rho as 1.2 times 10 power 3. Okay. So just like that. Another three marks easily. Okay. So always remember that up thrust is the weight of displaced liquid. Okay, there's something that somehow people always get confused. Up thrust is not the weight of submerged object because I've had people think that up thrust is the weight of the submerged object. No, it's not that. Up thrust is weight of displaced liquid. And then after that is rho Vg. This one here, there are some things to note. Now. Rho is always the density of liquid, not density of object. Hey, hey, sorry. I wrote X here. Right? The row here is always the density of the liquid and it is not the density of the object. And then this one here is the volume of liquid displaced, which still happens to be the volume of object submerged uh, is the volume of object submerged inside liquid. Okay, that's where the similarity is now in, in terms of the volume. Volume of liquid displaced is the same as the volume of object that is sum submerged inside the liquid. Okay, but when it comes to the density, the density is two completely different things. You are using density of liquid, not the density of the object. Okay, so that one is okay. Then after that, you look at part C. The figure shows you the variation of tension F or the length of the spring in V. The tap at the bottom of the cylinder is open so that a fixed amount of liquid flows out of the container. Okay, so this is one thing to know. Tap at the bottom is open so that a fixed amount of liquid flows out of the container. The cylinder now moves downward so that the tension in the spring changes from 8 to 4 Newton. Find out the change in elastic potential energy of the spring. Okay. So right now, the graph that you have here is showing the variation of the tension with the length of the spring. Okay, so this graph here, you need to be careful a bit. They're talking about 
length of the spring not extension not extension not extension or change in length of the spring okay it's not talking about the extension or change in length of the spring okay so from this graph itself you cannot simply find out the energy because right now you if you look at the question they're asking you to find the change in elastic potential energy of the spring when you open the tap at the bottom so that a fixed amount of liquid flows out so right now what's happening is that if you look at this diagram here the moment they open this tap water will flow out here water flows out the water level here will start to drop okay so water level drops so when your water level drops your spring is not like it isn't being extended as much anymore so the force acting on the spring will drop that's why over here you notice that they say that as water is flowing out the tension in the spring changes from 8 newton to 4 newton it's because your length is actually decreasing then your force would obviously decrease too because f is equals to kx where x is your extension or compression in some cases so right now they want you to find out the change in epe of the spring okay they want you to find the change in epe of the spring for your case here since they're asking you for the change in epe of the spring It will probably be easier if you try to convert this graph, this line here, from force versus length to force versus extension instead. Okay, wait, to force versus extension instead. Where this one will be, if you look at this one, when my force is zero, My length is 30. This is actually my kind of like my original length. This is my original length. Okay. So if I want to plot a graph of force versus extension, I will normally just start from the origin because I know that when force is zero, extension is zero. So gradually it will follow a straight line. So I just follow what I have here. Uh, if my force is zero, this is original length, extension is zero. But here, all the way to force equals to 8 Newton. This one is 70, but the extension would be 70 minus 30, giving me 40. So this is the extension. So my graph will be this. All right. So change in elastic potential energy of the spring, you want to find the change in EPE form the 8 newton value to the 4 newton value so it means that from your graph you want to find this section here where we know that 8 newton corresponds to 40 centimeter extension whereas for uh, a force of 4 newton corresponds to an extension of say x this one is x is 50 minus with 30 giving me 20 so an extension of 20 centimeter so this is what i want to find right now this area okay for extension extension of, uh, sorry a force of 4 newton gives me an extension of 20 centimeter a force of 8 newton gives me an extension of what uh 40 centimeter i want to find the area of this trapezium here so if e is area under force extension graph is half 4 plus 8 times with 20 times negative 2. Okay, from here to here is 20 centimeter. So this one is that length here. Change to 
centi uh, from centimeter change to meter, you multiply with 10 power minus two. Okay, so that's how you would get this one out, right? So I'll clear everything. Okay, so this one is quite okay. Just be careful uh, when you are getting you when you're getting a force versus length. Uh, just be clear whether you're getting force versus length or force versus extension graph, because sometimes the questions tend to try to trick you from there. Okay, so I think this one should be okay. Now for part two, they tell you that more liquid is let out of the container until the up thrust on the cylinder becomes 24 Newton. For the up thrust of 24 Newton, determine the length of the spring. So they tell you right now, they let out more liquid until eventually they found out that the up thrust has now become 24 Newton. So, when the ultra is at this value, find out the length of the spring. Okay, the length of the spring, not extension or whatsoever, just the length of the spring. So from what we know earlier from drawing the free body diagram, we always know that ultra is upwards, weight is downward, and the force on the spring is downwards. Okay. Even though liquid is being let out of the container, we know that equilibrium is still maintained. Okay, equilibrium is still maintained. The cylinder didn't fall all the way down. The cylinder didn't go all the way up. It's just maintaining that at the water level, isn't it? So since it is still at equilibrium, we know that up thrust is equal to the weight plus the spring force. So what we know is that the weight remains at 24 Newton. We already know the value of the weight from earlier. The weight of the cylinder is 24 Newton. It won't change no matter what we do. Okay. And then now they tell us that the up thrust itself has actually changed to 24 Newton. So if we put in the value of up thrust being 24 Newton, this is what we have. The spring force you will notice is actually just going to be equal to zero. Now when the spring force is zero, there should be no extension. Therefore, the length is actually done, the unextended length at 30 centimeter. Just now I mentioned to you that if you look at this part here, when F is zero, this one is 30 centimeter. This is actually the original length. Okay. This part here is the original length, 30 centimeter. So from here, I know that force is zero. There's no extension. Length is actually the unextended length of 30 centimeter. Okay. So that one is for this one. Okay, so this one was worth 11 marks. It's one sixth of your total marks already. Okay, so from there we move on to part two. All right, so let me just clear off the workings here. Then we move on to part two. Okay, step one is meant by work done. Work done can either be product of force and displacement in the direction of the force or distance move in the direction of the force. We know that the equation for work done is this one. Okay, so translate it into word product of force and displacement in the direction of the force. Okay, so the wordings is sometimes either you say displacement or distance move. Okay. But the important thing is that you must always say the distance move or displacement is in the direction of the force. Okay, they come as a set. Okay, but you can either just say it's displacement or distance move, not whichever you want. Okay, then from there, use your answer to show that the SI base units of energy are kg meter square per second square. So this one should be pretty straightforward. We know that energy has the unit of work. Work is product of force times displacement. Unit of uh, force is kg meter per second square. Unit of displacement is meter. So multiplying them together, you're just going to get kg meter square per second, negative two. So these are no issues. Very simple, straightforward. Then for C, you have a metal rod that is heated at one end so that thermal energy flows out to the other end. The thermal energy E that flows out the rod in the time of T is given by this equation here, where A is cross-sectional area, T1 and T2 are the temperatures, 
L is the length and C is a constant. Now find out the SI base unit of C. So usually for this kind of cases, if you are asked to find out the unit of a particular variable, make the variable the subject, the subject in the equation. So while I have the equation as E equals to CAT1 minus T2T divided by L, I make C the subject, I'm going to get EL over AT1 minus T2 times T. So from here, unit of C is unit of EL over unit of AT1 minus T2 times T. So I already know unit of energy. Okay, here they already told you thermal energy, right? If you look at the question, E is thermal energy. The unit of thermal energy, the unit of energy you already proved from the previous question is kg meter square second negative two. L is length, so it's gonna have unit of meter. T one T two is temp uh, temperatures, so this one is unit of Kelvin. Okay, so all in all, if you sub them in, you're going to get kg meter square per second negative 2 times with meter. Area also, you would know that it is meter square. So divide by meter square, divide by Kelvin, then times with T. T, I know, is seconds. Because here they say time T. T is second, okay? Right, although you have T1 minus T2, the unit of T1 minus T2 will just be Kelvin. It's akin to you saying 350 Kelvin minus 10 Kelvin gives you 340 Kelvin, okay? There's no multiplication or required, or there's no multiplication or division required for the units. The units can be used just as it is. Okay, so that's why here I say that T1 minus T2 is just Kelvin. Okay, so if you simplify everything, kg meter second power negative three Kelvin negative one. So this one is one mark, just like this. This is unit analysis. Okay, so I'll just clear this one off, then I move on. Okay, this one is chapter one with five marks. Okay, now define velocity. Velocity is just simply rate of change of displacement or change in displacement over time taken. Because we know that velocity was defined as this, right? Delta S over delta T written in words is either rate of change of displacement or just change in displacement over time taken. Right? So that is definition of velocity. Okay, now for part B, we ask you this uh, how we are we're telling you right now that you have a remote control toy aircraft that is flying horizontally in the wind. This figure shows you the velocity vectors to scale of the wind and aircraft in steel air. Okay, the velocity of the aircraft in steel air is 42 meters per second to the north. The velocity of the wind is 23 meters per second in a direction 54 degrees east of south. So determine the magnitude of the resultant velocity of the aircraft. So you basically have two vectors right now to work with. The first one is the velocity of the aircraft towards the north that is 42 meters per second. And then right now this aircraft is subjected to wind velocity of 23 meters per second at an angle of 54 degrees east of south in this direction. Okay, so what is now the resultant velocity as a result of these two? This one you can actually use cosine sine rule, you can use scale vector diagram, or you can actually just use uh, resolution of vectors. Resolution of vectors is by far the most, e I mean, is the better method because it can be used in all situations. 
and it's actually the most accurate out of the three. So let's just have a look at this one. Now, if I look at the vector diagram, velocity going to the north, and then mean velocity going in this diagonal direction, if I try to draw the vector diagram out, if I try to draw the vector diagram out, this one would be how the velocity diagram looks like. This one is the velocity of the aircraft. And then after that, this one is the velocity of the wind. My resultant will be somewhere in this direction like this. Okay. When it comes to drawing vector diagrams, there was a few rules to follow. The first one was always draw vectors from head to tail. Meaning to say the head of one vector always meets the tail of the next vector. Okay, that is what drawing head to tail means when you want to draw a vector diagram. The tail must meet the head, uh, the, the, the head of one vector must meet the tail of the other vector. So this one here you see is actually already been drawn from head to tail. You see, this is the head of the green arrow meeting the tail of the blue arrow. Okay, so this is uh, what we mean by drawing from head to tail. So after you've drawn the diagram from head to tail, any gap in the diagram, any gap in the diagram is the resultant. So what we'll say to you here is that the length of the gap the length of the gap gives magnitude whereas the direction is given from initial to final point. Okay, so these are some of the key things to note up when you want to draw a vector diagram. Draw vectors from head to tail. Make sure that the head of one vector always meets the tail of the next vector. If you see any gap in the diagram, that is the resultant vector. The length of the gap is your magnitude, whereas the direction of the resultant is given from your initial point to your final point. Okay, so what do I mean from that is that if you just look at your current diagram, I drew the existing vectors from head to tail like this. So you notice that there's a gap after that. This is my gap, the red color arrow here. Okay, this is my gap. So the length of that gap gives me my resultant vector. And how do I know it's pointing diagonally outwards is because if I started with the uh, velocity of the aircraft first, the, the vector of the velocity of the aircraft first, this is my first point. And then after that, I ended up with the velocity of the wind, right? This is my end point. Okay, so first, first point to end point gives me my direction, no? that's why it's diagonally outwards. This one, I have to make the term consistent. This is initial point. So if you try to use scale vector diagram for this one, you will still follow the same rule, just that you're drawing it to scale. So what you see over here on the bottom left-hand corner is the scale vector diagram. But I tell you one centimeter is 10 meter per second. Okay, so if I'm talking about the velocity of the aircraft and the velocity of the wind, Velocity of the aircraft being 42 meter per second, this one will be 4.2 centimeter. 
velocity of the aircraft being uh sorry, velocity of the wind being 2.3 meter per second this one will be 2.3 centimeter that's why right here you notice i drew it like this 4.2 centimeter 2.3 centimeter and then make sure you remember to put in the correct angles okay i know that this one is 54 because if i look at this existing diagram here There's a zigzag here that you can see. This, this, this. If this one is 54, this one must be 54. That's why I can say this is 54. Right? So from there, you already can see already. Wait now, let me just get rid of this. Okay. Yeah, so once you draw a scale vector diagram, just take a rule, uh, just uh, draw this line here indicate the direction also from your initial point to your final point, measure the length. The length eventually if you follow my scale is that you're gonna get the answer as 3.4 centimeter. So if one centimeter is four, 10 millimeter per second, just take 3.4 times 10, you're gonna get the answer as 34 meter per second. So this is using scale vector diagram. Now using cosine rule, you can also do the same thing, but usually cosine rule, is only for triangles. Okay, it's not officially covered in your A level syllabus, but if let's just say you use this method in your answers in the exam, they will also accept it. Okay, it's also a valid uh, method, just that it's only for triangles, which is actually all the cases that you have in A levels. Lah. Okay, so this one, if I just redraw the diagrams again. 42 meter per second, 23 meter per second, at an angle of 54 degrees, my resultant velocity is this VR here. So I apply the cosine rule. If you remember cosine rule, this one will be V square equals to 42 square plus 23 square minus 2 times 42 times 23 times cos 54, giving me this. Just to rehash a little what you have learned in cosine rule, it is something like this. But I tell you, if this is A, B, C, this one is angle A, this one is angle C, this one is angle B. So what we'll tell you is that if let's just say you want to find a particular uh, length, A square is equals to B square plus C square minus 2BC cos A. That one is your cosine root. Okay. Right. The last one is your resolution of factors. This is what I actually wrote as the main working here. Now, if you look at the original diagram, I mean, you look at the vector diagram, this is the mean aircraft velocity. This is your aircraft velocity. This is your wind velocity. This is your resultant. Now you can actually resolve the wind velocity. Okay, basically the wind velocity, I use a different color. The wind velocity is this one. You can actually resolve the wind velocity into two mutually perpendicular directions, namely the horizontal and vertical direction. This one will be 23 cos 54. This one will be 23 sine 54. This one here is cos because it's adjacent to your angle of 54. The other one will be sine, okay? Because if you use it to complete a vector triangle, this one shift to here, drawn from head to tail, gives you, is actually opposite to your angle. It's going to be a sine, okay? So here, you can actually resolve it into two mutually perpendicular components. This is the two velocities, horizontal and vertical. The aircraft velocity was already vertical in the first place. You don't need to do anything here. So what you do from here is that, the idea is that you want to sum up all the vertical, so you want to sum up all the horizontal velocities as well as the vertical velocities. If you were to sum up all the horizontal velocities and vertical velocities, you can represent the sum of the horizontal velocity as a single arrow like this 
you can represent the sum of the vertical velocities as a single arrow that looks like this. So these two, drawn from head to tail, will give you your resultant VR. Okay, it still follows the same rule that I followed that I did here. You still need to draw the vectors from head to tail. The gap would be your resultant vector. Okay, so because you when you found find out the sum of the horizontal and vertical velocities, and you draw them from head to tail, you're gonna get a right angle triangle. So from here, you can actually find out that VR is actually the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle. It is actually the square root of Vx squared plus Vy squared. Okay. So that was the main workings here for sign and, uh, for resolution of vectors. So in my case, my sum of horizontal velocities is only going to be 23 sine 54, giving me 18.6. But when it came to the vertical velocities, I have to consider 42 meter per second and 23 cos 54 meter per second. So just assume a direction that is positive for you. In my case, I assume ours is positive. So it's 42 minus 23 cos 54, giving me 28.5. So I just use the Pythagoras theorem for hypotenuse. I'm gonna get the answer is 34. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one you use. Resolution of vectors by right is the better one. But sometimes there are shortcuts like using a scale vector diagram directly. It's up to you to use which one you like. Okay, right. Okay, so this one is okay. Then after that, we move on to part C. Part C is on energy already. Okay, now they tell you that the engine of the aircraft in B stops. The aircraft then glides towards the ground with a constant velocity of an, at an angle of theta to the horizontal. The aircraft has a weight of 46 Newton and travels a distance of 280 meter from point X to point Y. The change in GPE of the aircraft from its movement from X to Y is 6,100 joules. Assume that there is no wind. So right now, this current situation here is that your aircraft is gliding from X to Y. And they tell you that your case here is that once it's gliding from X to Y, your change in GPE was 6,100 joules. Find out the angle theta. Now this one you can just use change in GP equation where it is mg delta h. Delta h will always be changed in vertical distance. Okay, this is fixed. Change in vertical distance. So the delta h that you find here would be this one. If I look at x and y and then I draw a little triangle here this one here would be my change in h which so happens to be 280 sine theta because you see this one is forming a right angle triangle this particular length is 280 sine theta okay this part here, the diagonal length is 280. The vertical length will be 280 sine theta. So this one will become 6,100 equals to 46 times 280 sine theta, giving you theta as 28.3 degrees. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward for three marks. And then after that, the next thing they'll ask you is calculate the magnitude of force acting on the aircraft due to air resistance. Okay, what is the magnitude of the force acting on the aircraft due to air resistance? Okay, there are a few things here that you can consider. If you want to consider just from the energy point of view, when the aircraft went from point X to point Y, the energy equation that would have come to mind would probably be this. The change in GPE is equals to the change in KE plus the work done against friction. 
But then the question mentioned one particular thing. Your aircraft was actually moving with constant velocity. Okay, your aircraft was actually, no, oh, sorry. Your aircraft was actually moving with constant velocity. Sorry, wait. Yeah, your aircraft was moving with constant velocity. So, you know, I actually did. I mean, I'm not going to do three, right? Yeah, sorry. So your aircraft was moving with constant velocity. This one, I know that since you're moving with constant velocity, change in ke is zero so this one gets cancelled off the change in gpe is actually just work done against friction okay in my case i actually just say that your change in gpe is actually the work done against uh, air resistance now so work done against air resistance is the air resistance itself multiplied by the distance along the direction of the air resistance so in my case it will be 6100 which is from here and then 280 which is from here i will be able to get the force of air resistance as 28 well, 21.8 newton okay so the distance used must be distance along the direction of the distance used must be distance along direction of fr the along the direction of a resistance okay there is also another way in which you can do this this one is just by considering forces that one is the workings on the right hand side here so if i want to consider the work uh another different way of doing this where i consider only the forces because I know that this thing was moving in co with constant velocity, acceleration is zero, F net is zero. That's the main conclusion that I can find out. Now, as a result of this, I know that whatever diagonal force downwards will be the same as the oppositely diagonal force upwards. Okay, right now, if I just consider the forces in the diagonal direction, uh, Right, if I try to draw the forces right now acting on the object, assuming that this is the aircraft, it has, okay, maybe I better just zoom in so that it's easier for you guys to see. Okay, yeah, this one I think is better. Assuming that this little point here is your aircraft, it has a weight of W. This weight W can be resolved into two components. One that is parallel along the direction of motion, one that is perpendicular to your direction of motion. So this one, perpendicular to your direction of motion is W cos theta. This one is W sine theta, okay? Let's just say that this one here is the direction of motion, okay? W sine theta is in the same direction as your motion. Now, as you're moving downwards, you will encounter air resistance. Air resistance is opposite to your direction of motion. That's why it's pointed diagonally outwards here. Now, because you are moving with constant velocity, your net force is zero. The diagonal force downwards is the same as diagonal force upwards. From here, I can actually come to that conclusion where I tell you that FR is actually W sine theta. That's why you're working is like this. You can just use this also if you wanted to. The first one here is using energy to solve. The second one is using force to solve. Okay, so there are two different ways to solve this same question. Okay, so that one is okay. The next part will be on Doppler effect. Doppler effect, I think this one should be pretty straightforward. Okay, for the flow effect, they tell you the aircraft in C travels from X to Y in a time of 14 seconds. The figure shows that as the aircraft travels from X to Y, it moves directly towards an observer that is standing on the ground. The aircraft emits sound as it travels from X to Y. The observer hears sound of frequency 450 hertz. The speed of sound in the air is 340 meters per second. Calculate the frequency of sound that is emitted by the aircraft. 
So when looking at this question, by now you should be able to uh, work out that this is actually talking about Doppler effect. Okay, if you've done enough questions already, you should be able to work out that this is talking about Doppler effect already. So a few things to note, they want the frequency of sound that is heard by, so calculate the frequency of sound that is emitted by the aircraft. This is actually asking you for your source frequency. The statement before that, where they say that the observer hears sound of frequency 450 hertz, this is actually your observed frequency. And then they say that the speed of sound in the air is 340 meters per second. This is actually your wave speed. Okay. Now, you don't have your source speed listed inside. When you're doing this question, you know that your source is moving towards observer. Moving towards observer. The conclusion would always be this. If your source is moving towards observer, F not is more than Fs. F not is equals to Vw over Vw minus Vs times Fs. Okay, so right now what you want to find is Fs. You know all the equal values here, Vw, Vw, Vs, and also F, sorry, I missed it. You know what is Vw, you know where is F0, but you're still missing Vs here. Okay. If only you know what is Vs, then you can find Fs. So you need to find out Vs first. Now, one of the things that did that they did give you was this. If you read the question again, they mentioned to you that from X to Y, it took you 14 seconds. And the distance traveled is 280 meters. You can assume that they're moving with constant velocity since in the previous part, they already mentioned that the, when the aircraft is gliding downwards, it was actually moving with constant velocity. Okay, so you can actually assume here in the last part of the question that the aircraft is actually still moving with constant velocity. The, the previous part already said that when they move from X to Y, it was moving with constant velocity. You see, they're still using the same points X to Y, and they say it was moving with constant velocity. So since they're using the same points again, constant velocity still applies here. So for constant velocity case, you know that you can use V is S over T. That's what you're doing over here. You're finding the speed of the aircraft, which is the speed of the source. You take distance, divide by the time taken, you're going to get 20 meters per second. So now you have the complete information already to work with this equation to find Fs. So if I know that approaching observer is where observed frequency more than source frequency, F0 is equals to Vw, Vw minus Bs times Fs is 450 equals to 340 divided by 340 minus 20 times Fs. Fs will be 424 hertz, just like that. Okay, right. So this one is Doppler effect, another three marks, giving you a total of 11 marks in total. So this one is okay. Okay, then the next one will be, okay, this one is something to do with electric field. So this one I will just skip for now. Okay, electric field is no longer inside your AS. So this one I'll just skip, all right. And then, yeah, the last part still talking about electric force. Never mind. The only thing that somehow still relates here is what can I do? 
momento no vos assisti. Eu só posso ter a tu, só posso ter a tu. Não, mas eu disse que eu disse que eu There are some bits and pieces here that you can actually do, but then after that, I have to explain some background from here. I'll skip this one first. If I have some time after this, then maybe I will just do a bit of this. Okay, let's just skip directly to uh, question five instead. Okay, page 12. Okay, for progressive wave on the stretch string, state what is meant by amplitude. This one, you just really need to remember the definition for, of certain wave terms or wave terminology. Amplitude is just simply maximum displacement of a particle from equilibrium position. The keyword here is that you must have the wording maximum displacement. That's all that is to this. And then after that, you look at part B. Light from a laser has a wavelength of 690 nanometer in a vacuum. Calculate the period of the light wave. This one, no issues. You have wavelength. And this one, you know, is light. Light is EM radiation. Therefore, V is 3 times 10 power 8 meter per second in vacuum. You also know that this one is vacuum, so it, you know it applies here. So you just use the equation V equals to F lambda, and you know that frequency is the reciprocal of your period. Just change frequency to reciprocal of the period. Sub in everything, you will get the answer as 2.3 times 10 power minus 15 seconds. And just by doing this, you are getting another 3 marks. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so this one, I don't think uh, it's that difficult that we need to do anything much on this. Okay, let's have a look at C. Now C, they tell you you have a two-source interference experiment that uses the arrangement shown in the following figure. Light from a laser is incident normally on a double slit. Okay, note here that they're using double slit. A second screen, uh, a screen is parallel to the double slit. Interference ranges are seen on the screen at distance of D from the double slit. The separation of the centers of the slit is A. The light has wavelength lambda. Separation X of the centers of adjacent bright fringes is measured for different values of D. Okay, so this one is using all the standard variables that we are used to. For double slit, it was mentioned before that we always use this equation. AX over D. Okay, AX over D. So this one is double split. Okay, so from the question, we know a few things. They tell you that the variation with D of X is as shown in this figure. The gradient of the graph is G. Determine an expression in terms of G and lambda. For the separation A of the slits, what is an expression for G and lambda for separation? Uh, sorry, determine the expression in terms of G and lambda for A of the slit. Now this graph here originally, I believe it is this one. Your current question probably doesn't have the second line there. Yeah, it doesn't have it if you haven't done it. I believe this was the original line. Find an expression for A, given this graph here. Now what you're supposed to do is that you're just trying to rearrange the graph into an equation y equals to mx plus c. So this one is y axis, this one is x axis. So what you do is that you're trying to rearrange according to what you see from there. x is lambda d over A, which is basically what you're seeing over here. Okay, so if I rearrange this, x is lambda A over D, this is actually equivalent to y equals to mx plus c, where you can say that gradient is actually lambda A. In your case here, 
Now we have to just write it properly. Gradient is lambda over a. Okay, this one. But gradient is g la. So this one changes to g equals to lambda over a. A is lambda over g. That's one way of doing this. Okay, so this one should be okay. Okay, for part two, this one is something to do with ratio a little. Okay, so let's go through this part. How do I draw the second line? They tell you that the experiment is repeated with slits of separation 2a. The wavelength of the light remains unchanged. On figure 5.2, sketch a graph to show the results of this experiment. What will be the new graph here? given that your slit separation is double and the wavelength remains unchanged. Now, you, from what you know here was, was that if lambda is ax over d, you rearrange it as x equals to lambda over a times d. If you plot a graph of x against d, you're supposed to get a straight line graph that passes through the origin, where gradient is lambda over a. Okay, so right now, just look at the expression for gradient, which you already found. They told you that the wavelength remains constant. So lambda is constant. So gradient in turn is just inversely proportional to A. But now you notice that your A is doubled. A increased by two times because from A becomes to A. So if A increased two times, gradient should decrease by two times. All right. You're still supposed to get a straight line graph that passes through the origin, but with its gradient half. Okay, so your new graph will look like this. Huh? Okay. Now, when it comes to looking at gradient, evaluating gradient, how to change the gradient, we always know this now. Gradient is always the changes in your y value over the changes in your x value. So right now, when you look at your current diagram, your change in x is the same for both graphs. So if I know that change in x is constant, sorry, let me write it properly. If your change in x value is constant, that means gradient is just going to be directly proportional to your change in y. So knowing that my gradient has dropped by two times my change in y must drop by two times no? so this one was my original change in y right i need to get half the change which is this one okay so this one you see is 10 box half of it is five box so i have to have the gradient i have to have the point here right in the middle okay because this one was 10 box half of delta y would be five box no? okay so this one would be your new gradient uh, new line with half the gradient okay so this is how you would do this question okay so this one is okay so not a big issue here Okay, then we go on to electricity. Okay, this one I think hopefully will be okay. All right, now you have a resistance wire of uniform cross-sectional area 3.3 times 10 power minus 7 meter square and a length of 2 meter that is made out of metal of resistivity 5 times 10 power minus 7 ohm meter. Show that the resistance of the wire is 3 ohms. So this one I think should be no issues. Every time you hear mention of length and resistivity, you should by now know that you're always only going to use this equation where it is R equals to rho L over A. So sub in everything, sub in rho, sub in L, sub in A, you're going to get the answer as 3 ohm. So this one, 3 marks just for substituting equations. This one, not a big issue. Okay. All right, then we go on to the next one. They show you, they're telling you right now that the ends of, a, of the resistance wire in A are connected to terminals x, y in the circuit as shown in figure 6.1. All right, that same resistance wire is now connected to some sort of circuit where they now tell you that the cell has 
EMF of 1.5 volts in internal resistance R, the PD between X and Y is 1.2 volts. Okay, from here, calculate out the current inside the circuit. Right, so based on what we know here, maybe let's zoom this one out a little. Okay, so based on what we know here, they told you that PD between X and Y is 1.2 volts, okay? So they want you to find out the current inside the circuit. The current I inside the circuit. So this one, I think you can do this quite straight forward. You apply V equals to IR for the resistance wire because you know the PD and you know the resistance already. So this one, you just use V equals to IR, PD 1.2 volts, resistance 3 ohms, current is star 0 0.4 amps. And always remember to write your final answer as minimum 2 SF, maximum 3 SF. When you calculate, you have a tendency to get this in your answer calculator, right? But this is just one SF only. If you unknowingly put it like this, uh, you might get a mark penalty, minus one. Okay, so just be remember that. All right, then after that, uh, they ask you to calculate the internal resistance R. Now, to kind of the internal resistance R, this one, I think, also pretty straightforward. All you just need to do is that you apply Kirchhoff's second law for this loop, the orange color loop here. The EMF is equals to the PD across my wire, big R, and across my, the EMF is equals to the PD across my uniform resistance wire, as well as the PD, plus, sorry, plus the PD across my internal resistance, okay? The big R is the PD across the wire. The small R is the PD across the internal resistance. This is you applying Kirchhoff's second law. But at the same time, you know that the same current flows through both resistances for the wire and internal resistance. So they have same current. So E is I times big R times plus small R. So you sum in the values, you know EMF, you know current, you know the resistance or the uniform resistance wire. Eventually, you'll be able to find out the internal resistance as 0 0.75 ohms, okay? So this one should be okay. Just on the, how I get this was, E is equals to I R plus I small r. Law. That's why I uh, factorize I out, I get this expression here. Okay, so this one is okay. Then after that, the next one is on your potential meter. Okay, so this one is when they start to change it to potential meter. So let me just clear all some of the stuff. Okay, from here, they told you that your galvanometer and a cell EMF E with negligible internal resistance is connected to your circuit in B. The resistance wire between X and Y has a length of 2 meter. The galvanometer has a reading of zero when connection P is adjusted so that length XP is 1.4 meter, okay? So now this is your potential meter. What they told you was that, what you know was that your entire length XY, maybe I better use a better arrow, the entire length XY, this one, was 2 meter and is worth 1.2 volts. This one was what you learned just now. But right now, you go and make your, adjust your connection P such that your galvanometer reading is zero. So once you have your galvanometer reading zero, they mentioned to you your length XP is going to be 1.4 meter. Okay, so this one here, 
is 1.4 meter and the PD across from here, what we know is that the PD across XP is the same as your EMF E here. Okay, so that I mentioned to you, whatever PD you have here will be the same as the PD that you have here. All right, at balance length now. Once your galvanometer reading has reached zero, so that's how I came to this conclusion. The PD across length XP is the same as EMF E itself. Okay, so finally EMF E of the cell, I know that V is proportional to L for potential meter. There's a derivation for it, but this one I'll just skip that one because it's not required. You just need to know that V is proportional to L. So V2 to V1 is the same as L2 to L1. Let's just say right now, the uh, situation right now uh, for the second case is where I'm having the balance line. So V2 is my EMF E, the balance thing is 1.4. The original case was that I have a PD of 1.2 for length of two meter. So you solve for this, you're gonna get E is equals to 0 0.84 meter. Oh, sorry, 0 0.84 volts, just like this. Okay, right. So this one should be okay. Okay, so this one is okay. Now then for part D, this one is your state and explain question that's got three marks. If we go through that right now, they tell you that the circuit in figure 6.2 is modified by replacing the original resistance wire with a second resistance wire. The second wire has the same length. Okay. The second wire has the same length as the original wire and is made of the same metal. But the second wire has a smaller cross-sectional area than the original. Connection P is adjusted on the second wire so that the government no meter has a reading of zero again. Stay and explain whether the length XP for the second wire is shorter than, longer than, or same as length XP for the original wire when the galvanometer reading is zero. Okay. So this one, what happens then if we go and do the changes to the second wire? Right, so let's just have a look at this. If you talk about the original diagram, this is your minimum resistance wire. This one was talking about the first wire. Okay. We know that our EMF is 1.5 volts, and then this one will be 1.2 volts. Obviously, this one is going to be 0 0.3 volts now. Okay. Once you change to the second wire, you're going to get something like this. Okay. You're still going to get 1.5 volts here for your EMF. But what you're going to have here and what you're going to have here are going to be different. All right. It's going to be different because of the changes that you made to the second wire. So what is it that you actually made here is this. If you relate to equation R equals to rho L over E, because you see you can mention of length and same method, right? So if you refer back to the equation, R is rho L over A, rho and L are constant. Therefore, resistance is actually inversely proportional to your cross-sectional area. That one I can see from here. Same length, same metal. Same metal really means constant resistivity. And this one I already know is constant resistivity. So the first conclusion I get is 
resistance is actually inversely proportional to my resistance. Uh, sorry, resistance is actually inversely proportional to my cross-sectional area. The second statement here already mentioned to you that you are actually having a smaller cross-sectional area than before. So here I can actually come to the conclusion that when cross-sectional area decreases for the second wire, the, the resistance actually increases. So this one will be R, sorry, sorry, this one will be area drops, resistance increase. Okay, so then after that, if area drops and resistance increase for the second wire, the PD by right should be larger because you see from here on the second wire, I know that this one is connected in series for now. If I consider the PD across my internal resistance and the PD across the wire, V equals to IR is constant. I'm sorry, V is equals to IR. I is constant for both of them, for the internal resistance as well as uh, the resistance wire. So the one with the larger resistance, having a larger increase in resistance, will actually have a larger proportion of PD. R increase, that means V increase. No? That's why here I can see that the PD across the second wire is larger. Okay, The PD across the second wire is now larger. What that could mean then is that rather than you having say 1.2 volts right now for the first wire, since your P resistance has increased, your PD is now larger, you could probably be having say maybe 1.4 volts here. Okay, wait, you could probably be having, for example, 1.4 volts here. And then this one is 0 0.1 volts. Okay, so right now, if you now connect it to that EMF that you wanted to measure, which color can I use, sorry. And then you connect your government, connect it to some sort of circuit that you want to measure, whose uh, EMF you want to measure. This is your new, your government meter you would need to, uh, sorry, the contact connected to your government meter, you need to move it around. Originally, you know that this one was 0 0.84 volts. Okay, but now the total PD across your wire is less. So by right, your P, your length should be shorter for the second wire. Wait, now, let me just redo this properly for you. This one with galvanometer. So this is not the same to galvanometer. This is with your galvanometer connected like this. So that time I was mentioned to you was that we basically told you this one. This one was two meter, two meter, 1.2 volts. And then after that, this one was basically 1.4 meter, 1.4 meter, 0 0.84 volts, okay? So right now you're still trying to get the 0 0.84 volts, but your total PD for the second wire is 1.4 volts. Let's just say this one, let me redo this. What you have currently is something like this. Let me change the colors a little. Okay, this one we told you is still two meters, but it's 1.4 volts now. Okay. Your aim is still to get 0 0.84 over here. But what is the length that you need to get 0 0.84 volts? Okay, so that time I mentioned to you before the concept of PD per unit length. Because the PD across the second wire is larger, your PD per unit length is larger. That means for any given length, maybe one centimeter, 
it has a larger PD. So to get back a given PD, you actually need a smaller length. So to give you some values here, I can actually just write down here. Wait, now let me just write here. If 2 divided by 1.2 divided by 2, this one is 0 0.6 volts per meter. But then this one here, 1.4 divided by 2, this one is going to be 0 0.7 volts per meter. Okay, so this one is telling me 1 meter is worth 0 0.6 volts. But this one is telling me one meter is worth 0 0.7. That, that's what I mean by you are having a larger PD per unit length. So from here, if you want to find out to get back the same given PD, you should be using a smaller length because from here, I can actually just show from here, the length required for 0 0.84 would be 0 0.84 divided by 0 0.7 is going to be 1.2 meter. Okay, so this is for the second wire. The length, the balance length required. I better just write this. This one, your balance length required would be 0 0.84 divided by 0 0.7. Give me 1.2. See, before this, you're, you're needing, you, you need 1.4 meter, but now you need 1.2. It's shorter. So length XP definitely will be shorter. This is the, so this is the detailed explanation one. Okay. Right. So this is three marks. But your answer is just basically these uh, three sentences uh, where you just say that all oh, cross-sectional area decrease, resistance increase, the PD of cross-second wire is larger, so you actually going to need a smaller length. Okay? When your PD across your wire is larger, that means the PD per unit length is larger. So you need actually a smaller length to get back a given PD, which is 0 0.84 volts here. Okay, right. So this one is the end of this paper. There's no other questions after this, I believe. 